somehow it must go in threes. I'm not sure why. Because I did it again, damn it. And again, my apologies. Uh, but I'm getting to the end of this. I want to finish this and then we'll go from there. I hope you heard that that the, the, the Clinaic monasticism was outside of Episcopal control. So bishops could not complain about, well, complain all they want, but they couldn't do anything about Clunaic monasticism because every Clunaic daughter house was under the abbot of Cluny, who was underneath the Pope. That would be important for when other new groups came about in the 12th century called the regular canons. There were groups of canons. What's a canon? A canon was a priest attached to a cathedral. If I'm bishop, I have my arm, you know, I want to be a prince. I, want to, I don't want to sit and preach. I don't want to, you know, uh, celebrate marriages. I don't want to have to sit and listen to confessions. I don't want to administer the sacraments. So I name a number of priests who are uh, technically a priest is in charge of a parish who was, who was underneath of then a diocese. I need priests to do all the ministerial work of the diocese as me as bishop so I can go off and be bishop and be my prince bishop. They were called canons of the cathedral. became very important. And then in the, the 12th century, they began to say, you know, we should really reform ourselves too. And some canons got together and they said, we are going to follow a rule, a, a monastic rule. Now, the problem is the rule of St. Benedict didn't really work. But the rule of St. Augustine did because Augustine was a bishop. He had established at least two monasteries, one for his early followers, or the hermits, and one for then his priest when he became bishop. So we'll follow the rule of St. Augustine. And they became known as the regular canons, canons who were following a monastic rule. And also then they became known as the Augustinian canons. And then they became a separate order themselves, the Primat Stratensians and some others. They were then organized in the same principle as the uh, uh, as Cluny, with a, the, an order directly under the Pope, with the the prior directly under the Pope, not the abbot, but the prior, and all daughter houses underneath that prior, the prior general or so, or general prior. There's a new structure that was increasing and developing, went first with Cluny, and then with that, and then we had this, the imperial cities and the, the communes being taken out of the feudal structure, and all of a sudden this nice, neat feudal law, legal structure was kind of breaking at the seams all over the place, even if people didn't realize it yet. When did, in the 13th century, a new group of, of monastics in the broad sense came along, they were organized the same way. And these were known as the mendicants. I think it's to be a very long story. The Franciscan Dominicans and then the Augustinian hermits, or the order of, of hermits of St. Augustine, all founded in the... 13th century with the Franciscans being the first and the Dominicans. They were directly under the authority of the Pope and they were specifically given the task of preaching to the people. And we get to the whole poverty movement, which I will maybe come back to in a later time if, I, if I'm able to. Because they had this idea, especially the Franciscans, of being poor and following Christ and really imitating Christ. We'll get into some of these conflicts between the mendicants because that's what is, in some ways, the Reformation was all about. At least the Reformation of the later Middle Ages. And there's conflicts between the Franciscan ideal and the Dominican ideal and the Augustinian ideal and how that all worked out. But these are institutionalized orders or organizations headed by a single person who was underneath the Pope. That's important different ideals, different perspectives, and what that all meant for the religious life of the people. Whereas these mendicants, they were all supposed to go and teach and preach to the people, which really upset the parish clergy, the secular parish clergy. And we'll get to that when we get to that, to see the competition and the economic competition as we go along. Now, I think that just about does it for the basic structures of Christendom because monasticism and especially the new monasticism as a structure is a basic structure was a basic structure of it um, the you know feudalism manorialism the different 
the two hierarchies, the free imperial cities, and all the cracks and fissures within this idealized system are important. Because so often the Middle Ages are, are portrayed as this unitary sense. It's an age of faith, and everybody just followed what the Pope said. No individuality or anything else. And that is as far away from the truth as you could possibly get. And if we don't understand some of these basic structures, we're not going to understand what Reformation meant and what Reformation actually was when it finally came about. Well, I'm sorry again for the three parts. I'm sorry for rushing through some of this. If you have questions, please just ask. Because this is, uh, in my view, kind of essential to get at what we're talking about when we start talking about changes and transformations. And we won't understand what's going on in the 16th century if we don't understand some of these basic structures of Christendom. And we won't understand the crisis in the later Middle Ages and the Reformation of the later Middle Ages and why I refer to it as the Reformation of the later Middle Ages, not simply reform, unless we understand some of these basic structures. So that's what's going on. Now, if you're sitting here saying, well, I don't get that. What are you talking about? If you don't know some of these things, I'll just kind of feed forward, so to speak. Martin Luther was a member of the observant branch of the Augustinian Hermits, one of the mendicant orders. I'll talk about the observant movement later on. His prince was Frederick the Wise, the elector of Saxony. The Duchy of Saxony had been split. Uh, between the duchy, between two brothers, the duchy, uh, the duchy was split, and one brother got Ernest uh, Albert got the title Duke and got Duchy of Saxony, whereas the other brother Ernest got um, the title of Elector and Electoral Saxony. So it had been one duchy was cut in two. One got to be called Duke but could not elect the Emperor. One was called Elector could not be called Duke. <laughs> but could elect the emperor. And Frederick the Wise was Luther's prince. And how did all that play out? And we don't understand what's going on, especially when we have a very newly elected emperor in 1519. It's also fun and exciting, I think. And it's not saying that politics is, is what was really going on. Or, but it's also not saying that theology was what was the only thing that mattered. It was all one and the same. This concept of the universal empire of rule, political rule and religious life and well-being and theological orthodoxy were all one and the same. We have to get back to understanding that if we're going to understand what, was, uh, what happened in the course of the 14th, 15th and on into the 16th centuries. I'll be coming back and talking about that. But that's why I talk about the myth of Rome, its transition to the myth of Christendom. And we'll see what happens to the myth of Christendom as it then transitions to the myth of the nation state. But we'll get there when we get there. Thank you for your patience. And I will still, I hope, um, stop doing my lectures in three parts. We'll see. I'll do my best. Okay, thank you so much.